Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. Valerie Scott sat in the residence lounge crying bitterly. The young nurse could not accept the betrayal of her beloved husband. It turned out that Henry not only cheated on her for the past couple of years, but also was going to marry his mistress. What a nightmare, God! Valerie thought to herself, he had to trade me in for that slut, didn't he? Well, yes, she's the deputy's daughter, all posh and dapper, and what am I? She's just a nurse at the city hospital, but we've been together for four years. It's not just a tear it off and throw it away thing. God, why should I be like this, eh? It happened about a week ago. Then, Valerie just happened to have a day off on a weekday and she decided to surprise Henry. She cooked the man his favorite roast and salad and went to his workplace. Henry worked for a large firm that created advertisements on the facades of buildings and billboards, so he often stayed late at work because of the constant meetings and meetings, where he and his colleagues solved the problems of customers. Once up on the right floor, the woman walked down the corridor to her husband's office. She was already anticipating how pleased Henry would be when he saw her. At that moment, a woman's laughter sounded outside the door of Henry's office, and then Valerie heard, Henry, wait. Don't be so hasty. Henry, that tickles me. The girl shrieked, and then there was a loud rumble in the office. What the hell is that? Valerie stared at her husband's office door in astonishment. Valerie determinedly yanked the doorknob toward her. It was of course, locked. Open up, Henry. Open to me at once, Valerie exclaimed. It's me. For a second, all the sounds on the other side of the door were silent. Then I heard some rustling, and then my husband finally opened the door. His shirt was unbuttoned halfway down, and his face showed traces of maroon lipstick. On top of that, the man couldn't manage his trouser belt. Valerie felt as if she had just been slapped in the face the humiliation she had experienced for the first time in her life. Looking over her husband's shoulder, the woman saw her. A gorgeous blonde in a tight short dress had already managed to smooth her long hair, and now she was adjusting the straps of her outfit while looking in a small, elegant mirror. When she caught Valerie's gaze, she only smiled wryly. What are you doing here, Valerie? The husband asked angrily. Why did you come here? Valerie, instead of answering, only grinned bitterly. Yes, that's what I'm thinking, Henry. Really, why did I come here? I just wanted to please my ever-hungry husband by bringing him something to eat. But it turns out he's got more important things to do. Valerie could hardly remember what happened next. She stood and sobbed, stunned by the bitterness of betrayal of her closest man. As for the beautiful woman, she just slowly sailed past Valerie on her way assessing the lawful wife from head to toe. Finally, she threw her lover over her shoulder. As soon as you figure out your problem here, be sure to call me. I'll always be waiting for you, my cat. That same evening, Henry talked seriously about divorce for the first time. Well, we don't fit together, Valerie. That's the way it is. Let's part with you in a civilized way like normal people. Valerie, pale as a sheet, sat in front of him on couch and absolutely did not want to believe what was happening. How could you, Henry? What did I ever do to you? And more importantly, how is this bimbo of yours better than me? Bitter tears welled up again in the nurse's eyes of their own accord. I love you, Henry. I really love you. But there was nothing but weariness and a faint glimmer of regret in her husband's eyes. He squatted in front of her and put his arm around her shoulders. Well, Valerie, what are you killing yourself for, by God? You're 25 now, you're not a girl, and I have grown cold to you. And I have grown cold to you. There is no longer the passion between us that there was before. Do you have a passion for this one? Covering her face with her hands, Valerie asked. She was so hurt and hurt that she could not express it in words. Yes, I'm 25, but what does that change? Yes, 
Everything, Valerie. All this changes. Slowly said the husband and stood up. Look at you. All day long I see you, either in your uniform, or in your uniform, or in your pajamas. What, Joan, what tenderness, tell me. Henry wrinkled his nose a little, but went on. And Lacey. Lacey is different. It's sparks, it's rapture, it's magic and the feast of beauty after all. She's the first time I've ever felt emotions like you and I have never felt in our four years of marriage. Besides, she's only 20, the juiciest. I don't think I need to explain to you how much of an advantage this gives Lacey compared to you. Henry, Valerie sobbed. How dare you say that to me? Henry looked at his wife, and then the woman saw the most genuine coldness in his eyes. It was as if he no longer considered her his wife, as if they were both already strangers to each other. Valerie, I propose to Lacey, Henry said decisively. What? The nurse couldn't believe her ears. And she's already agreed, my husband continued. It would be better if you and I got divorced soon. We don't have any children. So I think it'll go quickly enough. Valerie didn't know what to say to her. She sat in tears and felt her life crumbling to dust. This was not the dream of a girl getting married. Yes, they had not been able to have children all this time, but Valerie hoped that the right moment had not yet come. Now it turned out that Henry did not plan to build a full family with her. And by the way, while we're on the subject of divorce, we should discuss the division of property. I've been thinking, Henry shrugged and rubbed his hands together, as if he didn't know how best to tell his wife about his idea. I thought, what if I bought you a nice house in the country so that you could live in it comfortably? You yourself are from the countryside, so it would be the best option for you. And what about our apartment? Wiping away her tears, Valerie asked. And the apartment? Well, the man hesitated for a moment, but then quickly said, I'll keep the apartment. After all, we bought it together after the wedding. We can't share these miserable meters, can we? Valerie, think about it. Henry quickly spoke up, not allowing his wife to wake up. Well, we'll sell the apartment. We'll divide the money and then what? It will be a mere penny. What are we going to buy a room for ourselves with it? I'm sorry, but I'm not ready to live in some shack. And my job isn't too far away, you know. This way it's a win. Win for everyone. You get your own house instead of everything you've gained. And I get this apartment. It's all fair. Confused, Valerie could not immediately answer. On the one hand, the proposal of the spouse, now almost ex, seemed logical, but on the other. Are you suggesting that I live in the countryside? He clarified. What about my job, Henry? Henry wrinkled his nose and said sourly, Oh, Valerie, don't make me laugh. For God's sake. What difference does it make to you whether you work as a nurse here in the capital or in the countryside? Anyway, nurses get the same pay everywhere. You won't lose much. In the end, Valerie agreed. It would take a long time to sue, and it would probably be a losing battle. Not on her salary to get involved in such a case. Holy simplicity. She really thought he would buy her a nice house somewhere, not far from the city. There, she could start with a clean slate and decide what she would do with her life next. And so, a month after the divorce, Henry solemnly handed her the appropriate papers and keys to the house. He deliberately did not show his ex-wife her future home, referring to his constant preoccupation. Now, when she asked for a ride to the village where she was to live, Henry flatly refused. Valerie, if you were a human being, call yourself a cab. I have done everything for you from my side. It's time, my dear, it's time for you to start living a new life, completely independent and free from me. I can't help you forever. And Lacey will be upset if we're late for her father's dinner party. Valerie, though upset, but could not object. Henry was right. Now each of them was on his own, shrugging her shoulders, saying it was nothing. The woman herself ordered a cab and arrived at the address indicated in the papers. Henry, what a scoundrel you are. Almost sobbing, Valerie reprimanded her ex-husband on the phone. How could you cheat me so brazenly? 
An impatient sigh was heard on the other end of the line. What did you think my deception was, Valerie? He asked coldly. Valerie stood in front of a ramshackle old two-story farmhouse. To be honest, it looked more like a run-down hovel than the nice cottage Henry had so enthusiastically told her about. Yes, that's it, Henry. That's it, exclaimed Valerie. Don't lie to me about not having seen this house before you bought it. You said it was a comfortable farmhouse, and here it is. That's what? Henry barked rudely. Don't you show off. What you can afford to buy is what you got. Just take what they give you and keep your mouth shut. Yes, there are. So master it. You're a country woman, after all, or what? Stop bad-mouthing me about my past. Valerie shouted back at him. I don't want to live in such a horrible place. I'd be scared to spend the night here. Henry, I want you to pay me back all the money you owed me for this hovel immediately. I'm sure I can use it to buy a better place for myself than this, so to speak, cottage. A sarcastic laugh resounded in the receiver. Valerie, wake up. There's no going back on the deal. Or do you think I'm going to come looking for buyers for you right now? If you don't like it, you're on your own. Otherwise, I'll call my future father-in-law. You know, he's a very important man. At the snap of his fingers, you won't just lose this house, you'll lose everything. What do you want? Valerie's anger overwhelmed her, and she didn't know what to say. Finally, she spoke with contempt. My God, Henry. Sometimes I wonder how I could have lived with you for four years and not notice how cynical and mean you are. I hope your new wife will soon realize that it's too expensive to do business with you. With these words, the woman ended the conversation and wandered into the courtyard of her new dwelling. To Valerie's surprise, the inside of her house was not so bad. Of course, it needed cosmetic repairs and cleaning would take at least a week. But with the right desire, it was quite fixable. After all, Valerie thought to herself, this house might look ugly, but it was entirely hers. No one would come just like that and not ask her to go out with her things as her ex-husband, in fact, had done. After unpacking some of her things, the first thing the woman did was change her clothes and started cleaning the first floor. While cleaning, the nurse remembered her past. She really grew up in a village, but in a completely different region. Valerie did not remember her parents. She was brought up by her grandparents. She was brought up by her grandparents. The grandmother, however, once said that her mother was a seamstress, motorist, worked in a clothing factory in the district center. Who the girl's father was, Valerie's mother never told her, and her grandmother did not insist on finding out. Then, Valerie's mother became very ill, catching a cold in one of the harsh country winters. The pneumonia the woman suffered from gave her heart a serious complication, and six months later, Brenda, of Valerie's mother's name, died of a heart attack. When young Valerie graduated from high school, she immediately went to the city. She wanted to tie her life with medicine, but she realized that she did not have enough knowledge to go to university full time. Therefore, the girl decided to start with medical school, where she learned to be a nurse. Except just before graduation, tragedy struck in Valerie's life. Gabriella Bisset, her grandmother, died suddenly. The elderly woman had been feeling unwell for some time, but she stubbornly refused to go to the hospital. Grandma, but it's your health. Valerie tried to convince her. What if, God forbid, something happened to you, and I won't be there? I'm in the city, studying. Then what would happen? Well, it's not a world without good people, the old lady said. Neighbors will help. They'll call an ambulance. Unfortunately, the doctors simply did not have time to reach the elderly patient in time that fateful day. When Valerie was informed of her grandmother's death, she couldn't believe it at first. It was so unexpected. Grandfather Hubert, on the other hand, did not outlive his wife. Just a month after Bridget left, an accident took his life in almost all the Valerie family's humble household. The fire broke out at night suddenly. Fireman later said it was caused by a tiny charcoal that had fallen out of the stove, unattended by the grandfather. 
the loss of loved ones was a real ordeal for Valerie. The girl could not come to her senses for a long time. That's why she remembered the moment of graduation poorly. In the photo among the graduating students, the girl looked the saddest. Her face was not even the shadow of a smile. Gradually, life began to go back to normal. Valerie got a job as a nurse in the city hospital, and later she met Henry, whom she married. Now, four years later, she had to rebuild her life and start from scratch. Finally, the house was cleaned up and looked much more comfortable. Now, the woman had to decide on a job. At the local paramedic station, the young nurse was welcomed with open arms because of the shortage of nurses. Thus, Valerie found a new job, and with it at least some income. Soon, Valerie met her neighbor, an older woman in her 60s. Joan Graham was a native villager and was engaged in gathering mushrooms, berries, and various medicinal herbs. The rest of the villagers, the rest of the villagers, though they considered Graham a little strange and odd, never offended her. Joan Graham lived alone in a cabin at the edge of the forest. The old woman's only companion was her dog, Bunny, who served as a faithful companion to her mistress in her forest pursuits. One day, the women got to talking, and Joan Graham invited the young nurse to her house for tea, where she told her about her unusual occupation. Valerie noticed that there were no family photos on walls of Joan Graham's small house. Forgive me for asking this immodest question, Valerie said, but don't you have any relatives at all? Doesn't anyone visit you? Joan Graham stopped smiling. She sighed heavily, and then pointed to the small chest of drawers behind her guest. Valerie turned around and groaned. She hadn't immediately noticed the mournful framed photograph on the dresser. The picture was of a serious young man, looking at the camera calmly and a little aloof. God, Valerie whispered. I'm sorry, Joan Graham. It's all right. It's my son, William. The woman's eyes clouded slightly as if she were slowly sinking into the past. I once had a husband and a son, Joan Graham said, but they were both gone. Ethan, my husband, went to God in heaven seven years ago. He only outlived William by six months. I'm sorry for your loss, Valerie sympathized with her. But in the picture, your son looks very young. What happened? Joan Graham looked bitterly at her young guest. William worked in the north, something to do with mining. His boss, when my husband and I got the call, said that my son had been caught in a bad blizzard near their work camp. He froze to death. He was buried there too, so I don't even know where my son's grave is now. Joan Graham breathed heavily. It was obvious that she had never fully recovered from the loss of her only son. The elderly woman took a handkerchief from her pocket and began to wipe away the tears rolling down her cheeks. I'm sorry, Valerie, she apologized. It's just, when I think of it all, it's like an old wound opens up in my heart. I think it's been a long time. It's time to get over it, but I can't. The old woman told Valerie that William was born late. They were over 40 years old at the time. She and Ethan had been unable to have children for a long time, desperate, but a trip to a remote monastery helped them. It was a real miracle the woman recalled. Joan Graham told Valerie that William grew up a very calm and intelligent boy and only pleased his family until he was 16. A neighbor explained to the woman that she had always wanted her son to be around to help with household chores and get a job on the local farm. But William had very different plans for his future. My son's heart was always hot. He was beckoned by adventure in foreign cities. So he left home. He traveled a lot, he said. He traveled a lot, he said. He traveled almost all over the country. That's why he sent news about himself very rarely. And seven years ago, this terrible news came. Now, it is so hard for me to accept the fact that my closest people are no longer in this world. The elderly woman looked lovingly and sadly at the photo of her son. The only thing that saved me back then, the woman continued, was the arrival of Sergei in my house. Without him, I can't even imagine what would have happened to me. The gray one? Valerie wondered. And who's that? 
John Graham smiled. Oh, it was three years ago, in spring. I met a wounded wolf, wolf in the woods. She was pregnant, she was lying in the bushes. And I helped her, I took her cubs. And I helped her, I took her cubs. But her wound was deep, she lost a lot of blood. Because of this, and the wolf herself did not survive, and all her cubs died. Alive of all litter remained only one. Poor thing, he was so with his black nose to the sides, so shrieking. So I took him, put him in my bosom, and brought him home. I couldn't help his mother and siblings anyway. So you brought home a real wolf cub? Valerie marveled. Wow. But how could you take him out? There must be a special care. And my bunny nursed him. Joan Graham said, still smiling. She was pregnant then. Less than a month after she gave birth. But I'd had all her cubs by then. And I'd put them all with the local hunters. The dog is pedigree. But it was not a big one. That was the joy for all. For my bunny, that she found a foster son. And for me, that the baby would not be lost. Her neighbor seemed to glow at moments when it came to her second four-legged pet. When he grew up, he turned into such a handsome man. An elderly woman told me. He was lean, his paws long, all smoky in color. And on his chest, there was a noticeable spot a little lighter than the main fur. So I always recognized him when he came home from his walks in the woods. We used to walk there together. My house is very close to the forest. But the woods called him, the wolves called him, the wolf is a free animal, and he left. Now he comes sometimes, stays for a while, as if to check if I'm all right, and then he goes away again. Joan Graham finished her story, and Valerie marveled at what was going on. It's a real miracle to have a timber wolf as a friend. Valerie herself, later, also had a chance to see Serenki. The woman went into the woods for brushwood, but tried not to go far into the thicket. Several times, she froze like a stone. When she saw a wolf with that light cream-colored spot on its chest in front of her, Valerie knew at once who it was, so she tried to behave calmly, but cautiously, a wild animal after all. He may have treated her roommate well, but he did not know Valerie, and therefore the young nurse was still afraid of him. One day, it was winter. It was the middle of January, and Valerie, as usual, went into the woods for some brushwood. When she had gathered enough branches suddenly out of nowhere, Gray appeared in front of her. Oh, hello, wolf, Valerie said softly, and stopped, waiting for him to go further into the woods. However, the wolf was not about to leave. Instead, he began jogging toward the woman in short jogs and then jogging back. It was as if the wolf was calling Valerie to follow him. Do you want me to come with you? Valerie asked him, and Gray impatiently dropped to his front paws as if to say yes. All right, have it your way, Valerie said slowly and began to tread carefully in the deep snow. It was freezing outside, so the nurse had to put on her old wadded cloak. The woman followed the wolf farther and farther, until at last she came to a large clearing. At first, Valerie could not even understand what she saw in front of her. There were parts of some mechanism lying all over the place. Not far from one of them, our heroine could see the oval cockpit and part of the blade. It was a helicopter that had collapsed in the woods. Good heavens, exclaimed Valerie, running to the cabin. Anybody here? Hey? The cabin was crumpled like a tin can, but inside, to Valerie's great relief, was a pilot still alive. A man in his thirties was badly wounded. His arm was oozing blood through his jacket. How are you feeling? The nurse tried to ask him. Be patient for a while, I'll go get help. Pilot tried to open his half rolling eyes, but he failed. Valerie touched his forehead. The man was on fire. Apparently he had a very high fever, which meant that every minute of delay would inevitably be fatal to the pilot. The boy, he whispered deliriously. There, the boy. The little one. Save him. Valerie looked around in astonishment and then noticed a chain of small footprints departing from the helicopter somewhere deep into the woods. Hold on, 
I'll be back soon, and we'll be sure to get you out. Valerie promised him, and together with Serenki, she followed the trail. As she and the wolf walked, the nurse thought about how the helicopter could have fallen so close to their village, and they did not hear anything. Well, of course, there was such a snowstorm all morning. Valerie realized the wind was whistling, so that no other sound could be heard at all. The main thing now was to find the missing boy. Fortunately, Valerie found the baby quickly. The baby could not get far away. He sat huddled under a sprawling fir tree. The boy was silent, looking at the woman with eyes round with fright. His cheeks turned white. The boy was very cold. God, baby, are you okay? Valerie said, trying to catch her breath after running. Instead of answering, the boy rubbed his reddened hands. He wasn't even wearing mittens. Valerie grabbed the child in her arms and carried him as quickly as she could to Joe and Graham's house in the village. There, she explained the situation to her. Let him stay with me and warm up, said the old woman. And you run to the Smith brothers for help, and they'll bring the others up. There's a big sled in my barn. They're sturdy, left over from my husband. Grab them and get to the woods as fast as you can. Every minute is precious now. Valerie did exactly as her neighbor instructed her. And in a couple of hours, the man, Pilot, lay in the hut at the gatherer of berries and mushrooms. A young nurse was giving the pilot first aid, while Joan Graham, meanwhile, adding wood to the stove, was preparing a hot supper for their little guest. In front of him was a large cup of hot tea and a plate of fresh dried goods to keep the boy warm and satisfy his hunger. The kid was still silent, so Valerie and John Graham thought the kid was in shock. That's all right. Now he'll eat and the stress will go away, the old woman said as she poured a big bowl of hot meat stew with vegetables into the child's bowl. The boy began to gorge himself on the food. You bet, the old woman thought to herself, because the poor thing has spent an unknown amount of time under that tree. When he was full, Joan Graham looked earnestly at the baby. Well, honey, are you feeling better now? The kid nodded. Yes. Thank you for your help and for feeding me. I thought I was going to die of hunger, and thank you for saving my uncle. He's actually a very good man. He's actually a very good man. He just likes to take big risks. My uncle took me for a ride in this helicopter. It was his personal transport. He liked forests so much that he wanted to show it to me. From the bird's eye view, I think it was called that. And then we were caught in a snowstorm and the helicopter fell down. Uncle was trapped and he could not get out while I was in no pain. That's when I decided to go for help. But I didn't know where to go and I was already very cold. Where are your parents? Valerie asked worriedly. My mom died a long time ago and I don't have a dad. The little boy answered sadly in his voice. Uncle Chris raises me. I'm Noah, Noah Miller. Well, Noah, Valerie told him with a smile. You and her guardian will have to stay with us in the village for a while until your uncle comes to his senses, so you'd better not disturb him. He'll get well first, and then we'll see. All right, I don't mind, agreed the boy, and he volunteered to do the dishes for himself, much to Joan Graham's amusement. Oh, what a right little boy he's growing up. Wiping away her tears, she said. Chris is a lucky boy, I'll tell you that much. The blizzard outside the window raged on and on and soon the road in front of Joan Graham and Valerie's house was completely blocked. The storm was so strong that the gale force winds and heavy snowfall left their village completely cut off from the outside world. Power lines were damaged, and cell phone towers were useless without electricity. For this reason, the women could not call 911, and the rescue services simply could not reach them. The women themselves did not risk trying to go anywhere outside their village in such severe weather. So all they had to do was keep an eye on the boy and his wounded uncle. The storm subsided only on the third day. The rescue helicopter, which finally received a belated distress signal from the area where Chris' helicopter had gone down, began its search. However, 
due to a distorted signal, the coordinates sent by the boy's father turned out to be wrong. So the rescuers began looking for the businessman in a completely different direction. A little later, they did locate the correct crash site and circled the village where Valerie and her neighbor lived several times. But alas, Chris's helicopter was so badly buried in the snowfall that emergency services were unable to find it. After a couple of weeks, the man finally recovered. Valerie was able to cure him with the help of Joan Graham's extensive collection of herbs and her own medical knowledge. The whole time Valerie was caring for him, the woman felt a strange thrill and awe. She often looked at Chris sleeping, and in those moments her heart began to pound harder. My God, how handsome and brave he is, Valerie thought at such moments. After all, he was not afraid to fly in such difficult terrain, wanted to please the child. Surely his heart must be kind. Oh, how sad that she in her life did not have the chance to meet such a beautiful man. Valerie did not know that Chris himself, when he saw Valerie, experienced similar feelings. The young man literally skin felt the sparks running through her, flashing every time he touched the beautiful nurse. Her lovely, honey-colored, light brown eyes looked at the businessman with such genuine concern and desire to help that Chris sometimes felt a little uncomfortable. In his everyday life, the gaze of the women around him expressed only a demanding, cold, pragmatic approach to the choice of a possible partner. When Chris got a little better and began to get up and walk around the old lady's house a little bit, Joan Graham asked him why he didn't call for help first. And I, Joan Graham, want to see how my security service works, the businessman explained to her. I'm not at home or at work. I haven't been here for so many days, and the connection here is bad. Let's see how my manager can handle such an emergency without me, and how quickly they start searching. Joan Graham shook her head and smiled. You're a sly one, Chris. After all, your employees will probably be worried. If they really care, they can find a way to contact me. The man nodded to her. Judging by the fact that it never happened, my deputy will have a serious conversation when Noah and I return to the city. After that, he turned to Valerie and gently took her hand. The woman instantly blushed and felt dizzy with excitement. Valerie, I want to thank you. Chris was embarrassed, and a slight blush appeared on his cheeks. If it weren't for you, I'd probably be dead by now. And what would have happened to Noah, Lord? You were sent to me by an angel, no less. The woman lowered her gaze, unable to look the man in the eyes. At that moment, Valerie suddenly realized that she was in love with this tall and strong, but at the same time, such a sweet and subtly sensitive man. Come on, Chris. I just did what any normal person would do in my place. Besides, I'm a nurse. It's my professional duty. Valerie still dared to look into Chris's eyes, and at that moment, it was as if her soul was filled with birdsong. The businessman looked at her so wonderfully soft and gentle as if she was the closest and dearest person to him. Both knew that their feelings for each other were mutual. Chris could not explain why he so quickly began to feel for the nurse something much deeper and stronger than simple gratitude. However, at that moment, he decided for himself that he would not miss his chance. Valerie was like a single and rarest diamond among millions of bright but ordinary glass. They must be together, and he would do everything in his power to make that happen. One day, when Chris was sitting in Joan Graham's room, trying to help the woman fix an old radio, he saw a picture of her dead son on the dresser. Until then, he'd hardly ever gone into the herbalist room or asked if she had any relatives or room, or asked if she had any relatives. He hadn't had the time. The man instantly went pale, as if he saw a ghost in front of him, and then with a trembling hand pointed to the photo. Who is it? He asked the old woman. When he heard who the guy in the picture was, Chris whispered, But that can't be. William is my dead sister's fiancé. What did you say? Joan Graham could not believe her ears. Young man, I'm too old to be so cruelly trifled with. The old woman slowly settled down on the old couch. She put her hand to her chest as she suddenly felt sick, 
Her heart felt like it was stabbed by a needle, and it was pounding too fast. Joan Graham, Valerie jumped up to her. Are you all right? Are you unwell? It's all right, Valerie. It'll pass, the old woman reassured her. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you like that, Chris said cautiously. But I'm telling the truth. Your son was going to marry Michelle, my own sister. She was pregnant when William died on watch. He didn't want to live on my father and Michelle's money. He was always too principled. My sister couldn't stand the labor and went after him. I have been raising Noah ever since. So you are my Noah's own grandmother. My God, Joan Graham said with trepidation. So what is this? Noah is my grandson. Oh, I guess so. Chris smiled at her, then turned to the boy. Noah, I'd like you to meet your own grandmother, Grandma Joan. Will you let him call you that? Oh, oh my God, of course. The elderly woman exclaimed and pressed the baby to her chest. Noah, my boy, how lucky we are to have found you. Joan Graham couldn't hold back the tears that were pouring from her eyes. And to think she'd found a direct sequel to her beloved William. She'd had a grandson all along. And this girl, Valerie, saved him from the bitter cold, the same in which once her beloved son could not survive. Valerie felt only confusion. Such amazing coincidences do not occur so often in life. And yet she was immensely happy that her elderly neighbor had a grandson so unexpectedly. Now she would be able to experience the real taste of life again, and she would live for the sake of a kind-hearted and close person. Chris made a full recovery in another couple of weeks, after which he personally called his superintendent, and a car was sent for his uncle and his nephew. The boy was delighted that he now had a real grandmother and promised to visit her as soon as possible. The millionaire, as he promised himself, gave his heart to the pretty and kind nurse who saved him from certain death. After a while, he flew back to her village, bringing with him a huge bouquet of delicate peach roses. God, is that all for me? It's the least I can do to thank you, Valerie, the businessman replied a little embarrassed. I know this might sound a little childish, but would you do me the honor of asking you out on a date? Valerie, bewildered, did not immediately find something to answer. She certainly did not expect such a turnaround, though she secretly hoped that Chris might at least write to her after his return. And here was something like this. Flowers, a date. But in the woman's soul... Love and pure female happiness were already singing their joyful song. Yes, she said quietly. Thank you, Chris. I'm very pleased with these flowers in your offer. The man smiled and his face immediately lit up from within with sincere joy. In the corners of his eyes, like warm spring rays, wrinkles appeared, and this made Chris even more beautiful in the eyes of our heroine. Their first date was not their only one. Later, the couple had many more meetings. Valerie was completely won over by Chris's manners and chivalrous attitude toward her. Six months later, the young people played a lavish and incredibly beautiful wedding, which was attended by many guests, including Joan Graham. The elderly herbalist was very flattered that her grandson's uncle had invited a woman to her and Valerie's wedding. She baked a large honey pie with berries, according to an old recipe and promised to teach it to the beautiful bride, as Valerie and Noah were absolutely delighted with the pie. As for little Noah, he got used to Valerie so quickly that just a couple of months after the wedding, he started calling her mama. And a little later, the woman gave her husband and Noah some more wonderful news. She was expecting her firstborn. Now Chris and Valerie are getting ready to become parents. The husband has built a new, huge house for the whole family where he moved his beloved wife. He wanted to take Joan Graham there as well, but she refused. She was too attached to her old house, and she was too attached to her old house, and she was too old to move anywhere. Joan Graham enjoys spending time with Noah when he comes to visit her, and also often thinks about the fact that William managed to do the most important thing in his life, 
for which she will never tire of thanking him. He managed to extend his family. As for Serenki, who, on occasion, still comes to the old lady's house, Joan Graham seriously believes that the wolf has revived the soul of her son. Otherwise, how to explain that he led Valerie to the helicopter, carrying her grandson and his guardian? It had to be William who was the wolf. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.